the Palestinians count a lot of uh, on on the uh, international solidarity movement, on the Arab people, on the Muslim people, on the free people of the world who have been supporting Palestine, Christian, Hindu. I got a phone call yesterday from a Hindu friend mm. expressing full solidarity and telling me, brother, is there anything I can do to help the Palestinians? I've received a call from a Christian, uh, evangelical Christian. Usually, many evangelical Christians are pro-Israel, unfortunately, because of the war of narratives. He said the same, I'm with you. So we count on the people. Assalamualaikum, selamat datang ke episod 58 Keluar sekejap bersama saya Syaril Hamdan Dan saya KJ KJ dan penonton-penonton kita akan ada uh, tetamu yang hadir sebentar lagi Dan episod episod 58 ini akan banyak uh, kepada slot perbincangan tentang apa yang sedang berlaku di wilayah Gaza dan Palestin secara keseluruhannya Tapi dalam slot pertama ni kita nak bincang secara ringkas Respon awal, kami keluar sekejap kepada belanjawan 2024 dan kita akan bincang lebih menyeluruh KJ dalam episod seterusnya because kita nak episod hari ini lebih kepada isu Palestin. Ya, uh, sebelum kita komen tentang belanjawan yang dibentangkan oleh Datuk Sri Anwar pada hari Jumaat yang lepas pada uh, 13 hari bulan uh, Oktober uh, untuk membuktikan bahawa keluar sekejap cakna kepada perasaan pendengar dan juga penonton uh, kami we give the people what they want ya yeah, so far ni telah pun uh, kembali yeah. uh, saya terpaksa pergi ke kedai pajak gadai yeah. uh, untuk tebus, tebus lah. uh, semula uh, so far ni yeah. yang telah pun kita jual sebenarnya hmm. disebabkan uh, tak cukup subscriber di YouTube dan tak dapat nak bayar uh, Bobby dan sebagainya hmm. uh, so it's back lah it's back, it's back. so far anyway. is back so far is back ya yeah. okay kepada komen-komen um, Quick uh, response yeah. on on the budget, uh, Sharil. Um, saya sebagai seorang yang menuntut, yang minta supaya ada satu usaha ke arah structural reform ataupun reformasi uh, struktur ekonomi. Saya pertama saya nak cakap hmm. bahawa saya suka berpuas hati. Berpuas hati. Dari segi dengan, komitmen Dengan belanjawan ini Dari segi komitmen Perdana Menteri Selaku Menteri Kewangan uh, Untuk membawa ekonomi kita Ke arah structural reform Ada beberapa perkara yang saya rasa Belum sampai tahap tersebut mm-hmm. uh, Sebagai contoh uh, Subsidi rationalisation Ataupun rationalisasi subsidi Tidak sepenuhnya diumumkan Hanya mula dengan uh, diesel saja Dan juga uh, apa, Usaha untuk mengurangkan subsidi Yang diberikan kepada sektor uh, Ayam Uh, dan juga telur hmm. uh, tetapi tidaklah uh, menyeluruh tidak sentuh soal petrol yang menjadi antara bil subsidi yang paling besar diesel ni sikit saja diesel kan? ni sikit saja tetapi saya faham kenapa dia start dengan diesel mungkin dia nak start uh, dengan diesel dan selepas itu selepas padu pengkalan maklumat padu dah siap barulah pergi kepada petrol so dah bagi signal dah hmm. dah bagi signal awal bahawa subsidi rationalization is there saya percaya ada juga usaha untuk memperkembangkan uh, asas ataupun base taxation kita dengan uh, menaikkan uh, kadar cukai perkhidmatan daripada 6 ke 8%. Mm-hmm. But again in this, although I applaud, saya puji Perdana Menteri kerana nak ke arah tersebut dan tambah pula dengan beberapa butiran yang telah pun diumumkan sebelum ini uh, capital gains tax on unlisted companies, wealth tax on luxury items dan sebagainya. I thought he should have gone full Monty with GST lah. Mm-hmm. Alang-alang dah buat apa? Uh, this increase in uh, uh, service tax. taxes uh, ataupun services tax just announced that by 2026 whatever GST akan uh, kembali. Syaril? Uh, mungkin perkiraan beliau kalau kita nak spekulasi sikit letak uh, service tax cukai perkhidmatan 8% kemudian kembalikan GST pada uh, angka yang lebih rendah 4%, 5% mm. jadi yang nampak Naratif untuk mengurangkan cukai hmm. Mungkin itu perkiraan Tak cuma signaling lah Isyarat Mungkin boleh akan datang. Boleh dibuat dengan lebih jelas lagi hmm. Bahawa GST Akan kembali satu ketika nanti Ya ya. Saya pun setuju dengan KJ uh, Assessment secara keseluruhan Ada langkah-langkah ke arah Penstrukturan semula ekonomi Yang menjadi salah satu ayat Favorite PMX Selain daripada tata kelola 
Penstrukturan semula Penstrukturan semula Itu yang beliau selalu tekankan Jadi nampak adalah langkah di belakang Retorik tersebut Percakapan tersebut Cuma kalau kita nak lebih kritikal uh, Ni kritikal membina eh, Bukan kritikal nak mengutuk Jangan marah Kritikal uh, yang membina Bagi penyokong-penyokong Pakatan Harapan uh, Mungkin saya ada sedikit butiran Yang nak cakap dalam episod awal ni Iaitu berkenaan dengan NIMP uh, Plan Perindustrian Baru uh, Malaysia Um, NIMP ni dokumen yang selain daripada NETR Peralihan Tenaga yang kita rasa adalah dokumen penting untuk kerajaan ini dalam dokumen tersebut dan dalam ucapan belanjawan di, disebut bahawa perlukan pelaburan 95 bilion yang mana up to 10% up to 10% akan dibiayai oleh kerajaan hmm. namun yang disebut dalam belanjawan 2024 hanyalah 200 juta hmm. jadi kalau KJ ingat apa yang KJ sendiri kata dalam episod lepas bajet ni penting untuk kita tengok butiran fiskal untuk menjayakan NIMP misalnya 200 juta nampak pada saya sedikit kecil lah yep. jadi itu antara antara persoalan Uh, tentang uh, bagaimana nak menjayakan dokumen besar. Itu. Saya rasa sebagai penjelasan untuk memastikan bahawa usaha ke arah reindustrialization, uh, usaha ke arah membangunkan semula sektor industri di Malaysia ini berjaya seperti mana yang berlaku di, uh, di banyak negara sekarang ini yang sedang mengusahakan supaya dihidupkan semula the industrial base hmm. adalah the fiscal commitment. Hmm. I think uh, di Amerika Syarikat, di Uh, yeah. Eropah dan sebagainya berbilion-bilion beratusan bilion trilion mm-hmm. kalau tak silap saya mm-hmm. dibelanjakan untuk memastikan bahawa ada insentif untuk uh, industrial base ini dibangunkan semula yeah. so mungkin apa yang saya dah sebutkan tadi adalah uh, plan dia dah jelas mm. tetapi when it comes to putting money where, money your, where your mouth is dia tak berapa sedikit kecil lah ag- dia hmm. agak kecil lah ya, ya? Agak, agak kecil. kecil boleh ditambah dan kita tahu benda ni boleh berubah cuma observation awal uh, nampak agak kecil ya. uh, apa lagi KJ yang KJ tertarik yang bagus dulu sebelum kita sebut benda yang tak ada tu ada satu benda kita tahu memang tak ada kita terkejut <laughs> uh, bagus adalah uh, bagi saya sebagai menteri bekas menteri kesihatan jadi untuk Kementerian Kesihatan kita melihat peningkatan hampir hampir lebih daripada 13% hmm. which is quite significant yeah. uh, dan ada banyak tumpuan juga diberikan kepada kemahiran kepada latihan, kepada pendidikan we like all of that because itu memberi asas yang kukuh uh, kepada segala perancangan dari segi neta, dari segi NIMP dan uh, sebagainya uh, What about you Syaril? Uh, satu yang baik ataupun yalah, positif yang boleh kita bincangkan Uh, konsisten dengan image PMX tak suka pada mega projek dan sebagainya KJ sedar tak dalam ucapan beliau banyak menekankan tentang projek-projek kecil um, nak baik pulih sekolah nak baik pulih tandas nak pastikan jalan-jalan di, uh, uh, dibaiki uh, tempat meniaga mara warung-warung kecil gerai-gerai diperuntukkan dan sebagainya saya nampak mungkin ada penekanan terhadap perbelanjaan kerajaan yang lebih membumi dan merakyat Hmm. Jadi saya fikir itu juga angle politik yang beliau mainkan yang make sense uh, dan dan betul lah. I thought saya berpendapat bahawa tidak salah mm-hmm. jika PM mengambil pendekatan menumpukan kepada projek-projek kecil yang sekarang ni dah jadi antara trademark PM mm. sebab Madani ni bukan hanya nak melihat bumbung yang di atas itu menjadi lebih tinggi tetapi juga lantai naik Uh, making sure everyone moves up and benefits from uh, economic development. By the way, that's the most concise description of what Madani is I've ever heard. Yeah, so Sharil, Sharil, lah. I've I've heard you know apa yang saya sebutkan tentang Madani tadi bumbung naik dan lantai hmm. naik juga. I said that many many episodes ago. Okay. And I've heard people use that as Madani. Wow. Yeah, just no royalty, nothing, no eh? FYI, you know, yeah. uh, pro bono, yes. pro bono for PM for for you, sir. But um, <laughs> I, I thought that uh, PM could have, uh, selain daripada LRT 3 extension, uh, tambah station kepada projek LRT 3 mm. dan sebagainya, I thought tak salah untuk umumkan beberapa Big projek one. besar. Sebab projek besar banding dengan projek kecil ni. Okay, projek kecil ni ada kesan kepada kontraktor kecil, ada kesan kepada rakyat sebab projek-projek untuk kemudahan asas. Tetapi projek besar, the multiplier is much bigger. Sure. So I thought, you know, for instance, HSR. Mm. Saya big uh, proponent of HSR. HSR ni kereta api laju uh, 
uh, yang menghubungkan Kuala Lumpur dengan uh, Singapura dan akan berhenti di Semban, di Melaka, di Johor dan Johor Bahru dan sebagainya. Tetapi uh, I thought you know okay for whatever reason dia dah di, dibatalkan. Tetapi saya rasa Perdana Menteri kalau tak tak sedia untuk nak award pun uh, mungkin boleh memberi isyarat bahawa you know the HSR is back on. Hmm. And that would have created some excitement. Um, can disagree uh, sebab tak ada yang kita nampak melainkan projek uh, baru satu taman perindustrian teknologi di Kerian. That's the only one yang saya ingat lah. Minta maaf kalau ada benda yang saya tak, tak ter, saya terlepas pandang. Tapi yang saya ingat daripada ucapan beliau yang saya ambil nota uh, ialah uh, satu teknologi park ataupun industrial park baru di Kerian uh, yang hendak diwujudkan untuk mewujudkan kluster ekonomi. That I guess is the closest thing to a single Uh, big project lah bukan mega project pun big project yang diumumkan dalam danjawan jadi mungkin tidak ada excitement factor untuk business community dari segi projek suntikan kerajaan yang datang daripada belanjawan ini, ini mungkin satu uh, pemerhatian yang perlu dibincangkan selepas ini ya yeah, good things uh, benda yang kita bincang dulu yang uh, mungkin sengaja di ulang di uh, sengaja dijadikan uh, sebagai benda yang dipertikaikan uh, tidak akan berlaku tapi berlaku contoh discount PTPTN oh. uh, disambung we called, walaupun, it, we, called it. we called it walaupun uh, ia tidak mengambil kira cadangan progresif yang kita sebut tapi dia, dia 10% hmm. uh, diskaun atas baki hutang penyelesaian penuh pinjaman so still maybe favoring those yang berada mm-hmm. uh, as opposed to those yang mungkin tak ada kemampuan so itu uh, adalah good news uh, uh, penjawat awam of course big uh, you know, 2000 2000 2000 yeah. kepada semua penjawat awam, awam grade 56 dan ke bawah mm-hmm. tapi di sini Syaril saya selalu sebut tiga perkara yang Perdana Menteri kena buat structural change uh, subsidy rationalization separuh dah mm-hmm. dibuat dalam uh, bajet ini kedua GST belum lagi kita nampak ada usaha ke arah tapi GST tapi cukai adalah uh, meluas adalah mm-hmm. uh, yang ketiga adalah pension yang kita mm-hmm. bincang so he didn't touch he didn't that, touch that. He didn't touch yeah. that. so maybe one out of ha- one one and a half out of three lah yeah. yang yang dapat dibuat mungkin dia tak sentuh sebab dia tengok komen-komen yang bantai GJ <laughs> selepas kerja <laughs> mungkin utara. mungkin um, satu benda lagi yang saya suka adalah had caruman ai suri dan ai saraan KWSP dia naikkan mm. maknanya untuk skim-skim uh, simpanan ni uh, you can you can uh, do more yeah. isuri is a really good scheme ini antara scheme uh, yang telah pun diperjuangkan oleh Datuk Seri Dr Wan Azizah waktu beliau jadi hmm. timbalan dan menteri dan juga menteri bangunan wanita mm-hmm. this is uh, of course for husbands uh, to to uh, simpan on behalf of of their yeah. wives yeah have you done it uh, Well, we we should. Yeah. We should. Okay. That's not a question. <laughs> we should. <laughs> um, yeah, what else, Sharyl? Uh, uh, apa lagi? Satu lagi, May. Tadi, tadi kita sebut, sebut NIMP, kena sebut juga NETA lah. Neta, peralihan yeah. tenaga. Yep. Jadi, kalau peralihan tenaga ni, apa yang disuntik oleh kerajaan untuk menjayakan, ada dana mudah cara. Uh, total 2 bilion. Tapi saya rasa benda ni sama yang diumumkan waktu NETA lah. Dia mm. kata seed fund kan. So, maybe dia dah rename yep. dana mudah cara. So, that's 2 bilion. That's sizable okay. untuk bantu. Uh, projek-projek yang mungkin marginal dari segi return dia boleh ambil daripada dana ini untuk jadikan projek itu mempercepatkan target-target sasaran NETA kita ini. Yep. Uh, rebate 2,400 untuk motor elektrik je. Oh, yeah. uh, so, so, saya check motor-motor elektrik ni macam kita lah. Ada mahal, ada yang tak mahal sangat. Yeah. So, ada yang motor elektrik yang bawah 10,000. Dan so, soalan besarnya adakah Syaril mempunyai lesen motosikal? Uh, saya pernah saya bawa dah. saya pernah bawa motosikal. Itu bukan jawapan sama juga tadi tadi tadi. tadi, ya, tadi. Ya. <laughs> same same same. same. <laughs> yeah. Um, but Syaril coming back to this uh, cukai perkhidmatan, adakah kita risau walaupun cukai perkhidmatan ini tidak dikenakan ya? Saya nak umum uh, saya nak ulang, tidak dikenakan kepada perkhidmatan makanan dan minuman uh, telekomunikasi, hmm. parking kereta dan logistik. Banyak yang tak kena eh, ni. Logis, sorry, dia yeah, logistik. Logistik kena dengan logistik, karaoke. Uh, logistik. Saya pem- dengar ni kali pertama saya dengan PM cakap karaoke. Pen, penaja jaminan dan karaoke. Karaoke yeah. ni okey mungkin uh, lepas ni Bobby akan minta supaya gaji yeah. dia naik. Uh, tapi Uh, will this have an inflationary impact? Some economists says yes. Adakah ini akan ada kesan kepada kenaikan harga barang? Sebab hmm. yelah, orang akan uh, transfer past the cost to consumers. Yang nampak daripada list tu logistics lah. Ya, yeah, logistics. Penambahan logistik kepada 8% tu mungkin ada kesan pada harga hmm. akhir. Uh, tapi makanan, servis makanan dikecualikan kan? Ya. Yeah, yeah. So that is the biggest part lah. So coming back to this, bila nak naikkan cukai, dia is a political call lah. Sama ada bila kita naikkan cukai ni, dia berbaloi dengan apa yang kita akan dapat. 
Sebab hmm. tak ada siapa suka naik cukai yeah. uh, Rakyat lah uh, Kerajaan yeah. suka Tapi tak, pembayar cukai tak suka Bila cukai naik Tetapi saya difahamkan Ada yang buat simulasi Dan uh, hasil tambahan Hanya 900 juta saja oh. daripada, daripada daripada ni yeah. I, don't, I don't know if that's, that's correct That's uh, according to Mungkin Ya, yeah, belanjawan kerajaan di jangka jana ini. pendapatan cukai perkhidmatan tambahan 900 juta this from Deloitte. I see. Yeah. Okay. Reputable lah tu. Ya. Yeah. So maknanya tapi it makes sense juga KJ maybe because uh, kalau you kecualikan makanan that's hmm. the biggest portion of service tax yang ada dekat Malaysia ni. Yeah. So kalau itu tak terkena dan mungkin sebab itulah walaupun headline nya naik 6 ke 8% tapi actually yang tambah tak sampai 1 bilion. Dalam episod yang akan datang yang mana kita akan panjang uh, kita akan bincang lebih panjang lebar kita akan buat analisa berkenaan dengan peningkatan hasil pendapatan kerajaan berdasarkan kepada langkah-langkah yang diambil. Ya. Yeah. I still don't think that all of these things yang uh, PMX lah umumkan adalah sama impact seperti GST. Yeah. If you pack GST at you know 4, 5, 6% or something. And if I remember KJ dalam ucapan beliau daripada 303 billion revenue kerajaan tahun ini dia nak naik kepada 307. Mm. So semua ni in the end 4 billion je. Kalau yeah. betul saya punya nota ni lah. Yeah. So kita akan check dalam episod seterusnya. Yep. Uh, belum habis lagi nata KJ sikit lagi. Okay. Uh, saya sedikit uh, kecewa bahawa tidak ada butiran yang lebih mendalam berkenaan dengan projek uh, bagaimana nak memastikan rooftop solar Rafizi itu boleh dijayakan yeah. hanya satu kenyataan daripada PM yang kata tolong contohi Jentari Petronas yang membuat model uh, zero capex so hmm. dia kata Jentari boleh boleh bagi pada rakyat biasa rumah you tolong apa ni sewakan you punya rooftop so company-company lain pun buatlah yang sama tapi tidak ada butiran insentif apa yang dibuat oleh so, kerajaan so antara sebab kita Uh, perlukan sedikit lagi masa untuk uh, membuat analisa berkenaan dengan belanjawan selain daripada kita nak meluangkan masa untuk edisi khas bagi Palestin adalah disebabkan ucapan PM itu tidak hmm. merangkumi semua benda yes. yang ada di dalam buku bajet dalam anggaran perbelanjaan kerajaan persekutuan jadi so, kita Bobby kena, kena baca buku tu Bobby, Bobby dan Bobby kena Bobby. Bagi kita. sambil berkaraoke Bobby akan baca buku tersebut dan uh, Bobby akan buat uh, apa butiran lah butiran yeah. one by one dan uh, Syara another thing is sometimes this is this is the the benda yang orang tak tahu tentang budget speech ni ucapan belanjawan ni mm-hmm. benda yang ada dalam belanjawan pun kadang-kadang tak ada dalam dalam uh, yeah because mm. it's the last minute edition yeah, yeah, yeah. is the pm the prerogative Betul. the last minute Betul, edition last minute. so kita kena check balik tengok uh, apa yang ada uh, dan berapa apa yang tak ada dan kita kena uh, memperhalusi dengan lebih mendalam lagi tapi overall overall saya nak bagi gambaran umum uh, saya puas hati saya mm. rasa pm uh, yeah he he stuck to his uh, apa uh, his his brand structural reform bring down the the fiscal deficit what is it 4.5 uh, to 4.3 is 4.3 yeah, yeah 4.3 again sorry kalau silap but 5 to 4.3 yeah. is what i remember and uh, dan uh, ini adalah uh, langkah ke arah timing wise think pm decided to do it now because dia nampak ada 4 tahun sebelum pilihan raya better to do the structural reforms better to, to start announce yeah. the structure that's why sebab itulah saya berpandangan bahawa Alang-alang nak buat structural reform hmm. Should have done the GST this year hmm. You know It, Kalau dia nak buat GST lah yeah. Melainkan dia tak nak Ya yeah? uh, Just one quick mention about the missing piece Or yes. Ataupun satu perkara yang Semua orang nanti-nantikan Tentang dasar gaji progresif Ya yeah. uh, Yang mana Menteri Ekonomi Mempelopori idea tersebut Dan mengatakan Hanya beberapa minggu yang sudah Bahawa akan ada insentif tunai Kepada syarikat untuk menjayakan dasar gaji progresif ni naikkan gaji uh, mereka, uh, staff mereka uh, pekerja ada mereka ada detail dalam tapi, bajet? tak ada uh, belum baca buku lagi tapi saya rasa kalau dia tak sebut PM tak sebut dan ucapan tak adalah tu ya yeah. so, somehow the progressive wage model is not uh, so dua benda yang saya dengar belum lagi siap saya tak nak kata tak siap uh-huh. uh, dasar butiran berkenaan dengan dasar gaji progresif apa yang syarikat-syarikat yang uh, buat dasar gaji progresif ini akan dapat dari segi insentif ataupun dari segi potongan cukai dan sebagainya dan uh, of course padu padu is not ready yet sure i've been told padu is not ready yet okay. we'll be ready yeah. but it's not ready yet sebab saya rasa penting untuk kita sebut benda ni sebab PM dah bagi isyarat bahawa rasionalisasi subsidi akan berlaku orang yang lebih kaya orang yang lebih berada orang yang pendapatannya lebih besar akan dapat subsidi yang le- yang Uh, kurang daripada apa yang mereka menikmati pada hari yeah. ini tetapi orang nak tahu siapa mm. yeah, siapa Yalah. yang layak that's padu. Macam mana? that's padu padu yeah. ni uh, pengkalan maklumat baru yang dibangunkan uh, yang dipelopori oleh uh, Kementerian Ekonomi mm. yang akan menggunakan data point daripada pelbagai 
sumber bukan hanya daripada sumber LHDN untuk menunjuk siapa yang layak untuk terima subsidi. Yeah. Yeah? Yeah. So we're still waiting in that sense. Sure, but still very shocking for me that dasar progresif, the gaji progresif tidak disebut langsung dalam yeah. ucapan bajet. So mungkin kita akan bincang lebih mendalam dalam episod seterusnya. Okay, kita akan okay. break dan kita akan kembali dengan episod uh, ataupun segmen khas berkenaan dengan Palestin dan juga Gaza. Selamat kembali ke episod ke-58 Keluar Sekejap. Hari ini untuk episod kali ini, kita dah bincang berkenaan dengan belanjawan tahun 2024 selesai. Dan sekarang ini kita nak beralih Syaril ke satu isu yang masih masih menjadi tumpuan masyarakat dunia. Termasuk di Malaysia juga iaitu serangan rejim Zionis Tel Aviv terhadap wilayah semenanjung Gaza di Palestin dan saya yakin Syaril pun sedang mengikuti berita ni pada setiap waktu setiap masa um, mungkin Syaril sebelum kita memperkenalkan tetamu khas kita pada hari ini Syaril mungkin ada some reflections on the last few days uh, reflections seperti mana 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 saja manusia dan seorang umat uh, Islam, uh, seorang Muslim sudah tentu bersedih dengan apa yang sedang berlaku, telah berlaku dan mungkin akan berlaku uh, terutamanya di wilayah semenanjung Gaza pada masa yang sama buntu apa sebenarnya yang boleh kita buat untuk bantu buntu apa sebenarnya solusi kalau tak jangka panjang pun jangka sederhana untuk menghentikan the human suffering uh, on all sides mm. on all sides mm. Ya, ini satu tragedi besar. Tetapi bagi saya, saya setiap hari saya semakin marah, Syaril. Sebab antara lain lah, antara lain. Banyak sebab yang kita marah. Antara lain adalah hipokrasi, terutamanya dunia barat lah. Kuasa-kuasa besar dan pendirian mereka. Seolah-olah penderitaan yang dihadapi oleh rakyat Palestin ni tidak ada makna, tidak ada nilai dan mereka sajalah yang dianggap sebagai pengganas ataupun uh, the perpetrator dalam keadaan di Palestin sekarang. Ya? Kalau saya boleh tambah KJ, ia mudah untuk kita lash out kepada kuasa barat. Tapi dalam satu lagi reflection saya adalah kalau kita marah tentang respon barat, kita pun perlu mempersoalkan apa yang telah berlaku dalam kepimpinan dunia Islam itu sendiri. Because it's yeah. not just the West. Yeah. Ini semua perkara yang akan kita kupas uh, bersama dengan tetamu khas kita iaitu salah seorang uh, rakyat Palestin, rakyat Palestin yang sudah lama uh, bermastautin di negara kita, uh, sahabat saya dan juga saudara Syahril juga sebab waktu kami berada dalam pemuda AMNO setiap kali ada demonstrasi untuk kita menyokong dan memperjuangkan isu Palestin dan kita membantah rejim Tel Aviv, sosok inilah yang akan tampil bersama dengan kami dalam demonstrasi. Dan untuk makluman pendengar, beliau telah pun mendapat pendidikan tinggi semua di Malaysia. Hmm. Daripada sarjana muda di Universiti Islam Antarabangsa, sambung ijazah sarjana master's juga di Universiti Islam Antarabangsa dan telah tamatkan PhD beliau di Universiti Melaya pada tahun ini. Dan uh, tetamu khas kita pada hari ini tidak lain tidak bukan saudara Muslim Imran. Assalamualaikum brother. Waalaikumsalam warahmatullahi. How are you? Alhamdulillah good. Ya. Yeah. Saudara Muslim Imran adalah uh, pengarah pengasas founding director of the Asia Middle East Center for Research and Dialogue, satu think tank yang berpengkalan di Malaysia. Sebelum itu beliau adalah pengerusi kepada Lembaga Pengarah Palestine ataupun Palestinian Cultural Organization of Malaysia uh, sejak tahun 2012. Saya rasa Muslim uh, saya dah kenal Muslim hampir 20 tahun kot. Ya. Yeah? Ya. Yeah, yeah. 20 tahun. Lebih kurang 19 tahun. Lebih kurang 19 tahun. Hmm. Ya, yeah. dan uh, uh, kami dah ada persahabatan yang baik dan uh, sesuatu yang saya nak sebut 
uh, selain daripada usaha-usaha beliau sebagai seorang penuntut di Malaysia, beliau juga uh, adalah seorang advokat, seorang yang terlibat dalam advokasi bagi pihak Palestin, seorang yang menerajui sebuah think tank yang melihat kepada isu-isu yang berkenaan dengan uh, Timur Tengah dan juga hubungan dengan uh, Asia. Dan beliau juga mempunyai PhD dalam bidang uh, dasar luar negara, Malaysia. So dia adalah expert kepada Malaysian foreign policy. Uh, dan I hope you don't mind Muslim, uh, beliau juga adalah ahli Biro Antarabangsa, Hamas. Uh, yang bertanggungjawab untuk rantau Asia. So untuk makluman pendengar kita, Muslim dia fasih dalam bahasa Melayu. Bahasa Melayu okey ya? Eh? Boleh insyaAllah. Boleh. Tetapi um, yeah. saya telah minta Muslim that we conduct this segment in English. Ya, yeah? Dan saya tahulah mungkin ada pendengar dan penonton kita yang komplain nanti. Tetapi tujuan sebab dia, tujuan dia, yeah. dia ini adalah isu antarabangsa. Dan KS pun semakin mengantarabangsa. <laughs> uh, dan, ada audiens uh, kita yang uh, bukan... Dan Malaysia saja. Ada audience uh, luar daripada Malaysia. Dan and we want this message to reach beyond Malaysian shores. Cheryl's English is possible, so hmm. kita telah buat keputusan untuk uh, cakap dalam bahasa. Are you okay with English today? Uh, boleh lah sikit Boleh sikit. Sikit, sikit. <laughs> Okay, but coming to the serious point, and this is a serious segment. Uh, Muslim, first of all, thank you for being on on Keluar Sekejap. Join uh, Cheryl and myself. Let me kick this off, and then uh, we'll get everyone discussing this issue first of all you know on behalf of the Kluas Kejap team we're very uh, upset and and our condolences to to the people of Palestine uh, Palestine especially those who are staying in in Gaza i understand that you lost a colleague recently uh, who just went back to Gaza from Malaysia and within a few days uh, he was killed in one of the attacks from the Israeli forces. Muslim, can you tell us, I know a lot of our listeners and a lot of our viewers have been watching this on TV, have been following this on social media, but you've been in touch with people in Gaza. You have friends in Gaza. You've been to Gaza. What is the situation in Gaza now? Thank you very much, uh, uh, Brother Khairi and Brother Shahril for having me on this show. The Current situation in Gaza is uh, unimaginable. I've been to Gaza right after the 2012 war. Uh, that was a devastating war, but it's nothing compared to what's happening right now. Israel's um, uh, desperate response uh, against the uh, Palestinian preemptive uh, uh, military operation was one of uh, total destruction, mass killing, genocide, ethnic cleansing, they ask people to leave their homes and then they bomb them after leaving their homes. They cut off electric supply, water supply, internet supply. They, they are uh, denying Palestinians medical supply. As we speak, Palestinian hospitals have less than 50% supply of their medical needs. Uh, several hospitals uh, announced they are shutting down due to lack of everything, literally everything. And in fact, even before this war, Palestinian hospitals don't provide food to their uh, uh, patients. And can you imagine that? You have to bring your food from home if you are an inpatient. Um, so Israel is denying Palestinians very basic human rights. And uh, this is happening, unfortunately, with the uh, uh, <coughs> complicity of the international community, everyone. Uh, Muslim, um, a lot of things to unpack from what you just said, but one of the battles here is a battle of narratives. And uh, as somebody steeped in, in you know, psychological warfare and also contestations, you would appreciate that. Uh, the narrative is very important and we see this narrative evolving in just this one week, one week plus. One of the first narratives that the Israelis wanted to put into the minds of the international community is that this was an unprovoked attack, that this was Hamas militants going in, killing civilians, innocent civilians. We, so you mentioned just now preemptive uh, attack or preemptive military operation, sorry, uh, which I've heard used by the Palestinians. Maybe describe what you mean by preemptive military operation. And just for clarity, what Sharil is referring to is Muslim said Hamas's operation last Saturday mm. was a preemptive 
military operation. That that we're asking, why do you say preemptive? Um, I learned two things in my uh, masters. Uh, when I did master of international relations by my late supervisor, Dr. Ishtiaq Hussein. Number one, history did not start today mm. or did not start when you started writing your uh, thesis. Um, and the same applies to what's happening in Gaza. History did not start on the 7th of October, neither uh, on the you know 2012 war or in 2020, 2021. Our history is deeply rooted in Palestine and Israel's history in Palestine is new and it was one of destruction so this is uh, number one the other thing that i learned is that uh, you have to always question the narrative of the powerful israel is the powerful side israel has for ages uh, framed the narrative about what's happening in palestine i mean you go on netflix how how, do, how how many palestinian movies do you find on netflix that's just an example you go on google you go on facebook write something sympathetic to the Palestinians and see what will happen to your Facebook account. Uh, I've lost my personal Facebook account several times. Um, I've, I've lost my Instagram account several times. Um, and yeah, they frame the narrative. So we don't have to take what they say, uh, you know, and accept it. We have to question it. What happened in Gaza is that the Palestinians have been under siege for 16 years. They have been denied water supply, electric supply for, for ages. It's not new. But what's happening now is in a bigger scale. Everything that you see happening now in Gaza has been happening for decades. It's just that uh, the international media attention is, is very uh, high now. And what is happening is in big scale. So hospitals not having medical supplies, it's, it's not new. Gaza is under real blockade. Um, be even before, since even 2007. Before, of course, in, 20, in, 20, in 2011, uh, in, tw in May 2010, uh, Malaysians sent humanitarian uh, uh, volunteers to Gaza in the Mavi Marmara yes. uh, convoy, or, or sorry, uh, fleet. Flotilla. Fleet, flotilla. 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 Mm. Freedom Flotilla. Um, they were attacked. Yeah. Why were Malaysians, Turks, and others sending this Freedom Flotilla to Gaza? Because Gaza was under siege. Yeah. The Palestinian people of Gaza, most of them, maybe I can't get uh, an exact figure, but let's say 95, 97% of the Palestinians in Gaza have never left Gaza, have mm. never been to Al-Aqsa itself, mm. which is also in Palestine. They are denied access to the world. And today, Israel is, is still still uncomfortable that the world is seeing their uh, suffering in Gaza, the Palestinian suffering in Muslim, Gaza. Maybe paint They're a denying picture media for, coming to Gaza. Maybe yeah. paint a picture for our audience how small Gaza is oh, Gaza compared is to the small. 2 million plus that? Uh, you can um, drive from the Rafah crossing all the way to the extreme north uh, of uh, Gaza within half an hour or less. And, and you've If your got, car is good mm -hmm. in, in 25 minutes. Maybe and, and you've got more than 2 million people you have stuck in two cramped three conditions. Million Palestinians, uh, con you know, in, in a very uh, dense uh, yeah. uh, uh, areas which are about one third of the Gaza territory. I mean, they're not really dispersed all over the region. And, and what is the living standards like? Is it like, you know, next to the coastal area, people are enjoying themselves? Okay. Before the war started, before this recent war started, uh, international um, humanitarian uh, NGOs and uh, even United Nations linked organizations used to say that Gaza will be uninhabitable by 2020. We are in 2023. Uh, Gaza's um, unemployment rate is always above 50%. Always. It's, since the siege started, it's never been uh, better. Uh, the um, you know, am amount of uh, deaths because of lack of medical supply or lack of medical attention is also huge. Cancer patients, for instance, have, have no, no chance. Mm. No, no medical care. Yeah. We don't have cancer hospitals in, uh, yeah. in Gaza. Um, the, the, the lifestyle in Gaza, the, the daily living is, is really hard. Uh, people have to survive on sometimes $1 a day, $2 a day. Uh, malnutrition is very high. But that's not our biggest problem, you know. Some people think that Palestinians are poor, send them some money and that's it. No, no, that's not our biggest problem. Uh, the economy is bad. But if we are given any opportunity, our economy will flourish. Because I see Palestinians going anywhere and doing well. Of course. Uh, Education-wise, 99.7% literacy rate. That's the highest in the Middle East. Yeah. Um, 
the highest oh. ratio of PhD holders in, 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 in the Middle East, etc. So our problem is not economic. The economic problem is only a byproduct of the Israeli occupation. Our problem is occupation. Israel has taken over Palestine. It has um, tried to eliminate the Palestinians in 1948. It managed to kick out about 900,000 out of Palestine who, who continue to be refugees until today. It uh, got stuck with a few Palestinians and these Palestinians refused to, to submit. So yeah. the uh, North American Australian model of uh, wiping out the uh, indigenous people, indigenous people didn't work in Palestine. Yeah, yeah. Unfortunately for them, fortunately for us. Well, I, I want to uh, continue on this, this conditions in Gaza. You mentioned the flotilla that was attacked, the Mavi Mar Marmara. Uh, with Malaysian aid volunteers. I went on the second flotilla from, uh, it was supposed to depart from Corfu mm -hmm. in Greece. Um, and we were supposed to bring aid to Gaza, the blockade. So just, just so that people know, since 2007, there's been a blockade of Gaza. You cannot get things into Gaza or out of Gaza from all, from land, air, uh, or from the sea crossing. It's all uh, blocked by the Israelis and of course in the Rafah is blocked by the uh, Egyptians and uh, I don't know if you remember Muslim but we couldn't leave Corfu we tried to leave Corfu mm. and we were stopped by the Greek uh, commando police commandos uh, that is the complicitness of the world not just Israel but like you said the world in continuing this blockade for the last what 13 years or whatever it is and Greece is considered Friendly to the Palestinians compared to other European nations. There you go. So it, it, what, what I'm trying to say is that Muslims point about history not starting last Saturday. There was this subjugation of the Palestinian people. This, this preemptive attack did not start in a vacuum. Exactly. It did not start in a vacuum. Because I think what Sharil was also trying to ask you and challenging you is that Israel is saying that their response right now Killing 2,000 plus Palestinians, bombing the hell out of Gaza right now, is in self-defense. Let me give you the Palestinian narrative. Over the last few days, if you followed the news before the uh, 7th of October, what was happening in Al-Aqsa Mosque? The desecration that is happening in Al-Aqsa, the attacks on the West Bank, the threats by Israeli ministers to wipe out Huwara, for instance. Mm. Uh, th they were publicly threatening to uh, commit genocide. The ongoing uh, attacks on civilians in the West Bank, the extrajudicial killings. Since the beginning of this year, 250 Palestinians were killed. Children, we're talking about mostly children, were shot dead by the Israeli uh, snipers or uh, military uh, officers all over the West Bank. So the problem wasn't actually in Gaza alone. Al-Aqsa was being desecrated, and Al-Aqsa is not the responsibility of the Palestinians alone. It's not the responsibility of Gaza alone. It's the responsibility of the whole Muslim yes. world. It's a holy sanctuary. It's the yeah. first Qibla for Muslims. But if you realize that the OIC and the Muslim world isn't doing enough to protect its first Qibla, so you have to take action into your own hands. And that's one, one, one reason why the whole thing started. The situation in Al-Aqsa, the extrajudicial judicial killings in the West Bank, the ongoing uh, siege on Gaza, the, uh, and can you also explain to our listeners and our viewers, perhaps, the Netanyahu present government is probably the most right-wing Israeli government yes. in the history of Israel, uh, and also the sort of settlement building, kicking Palestinians off land that's supposed to be Palestinian land. I mean, can you also touch on yes, that? That's important, actually. Um, to put things in, into context, Israel started as a colonial a settler colonial uh, occupation. It developed over the years into an apartheid. So there are layers of uh, uh, oppression. The Israeli society has been shifting towards the right in uh, an accelerating pace. By the year 2000, uh, a, a full right-wing government came to power in Israel under Ariel uh, Sharon. Sharon. And until today, Israel is being run by right-wing governments, extreme right-wing governments. In the 90s, Netanyahu used to be seen as the, Moderate. No, Cent in the 90s, right. he used to be seen Center as right. the yeah. most extreme yeah, sorry. of all. Yes. Right. Yes. Today, he's seen as a moderate. <laughs> <laughs> People in the West think Netanyahu is a center-right uh, leader. He, he is an extremist. Mm. But over the years, Israel um, uh, the spectrums started moved, yeah. to move towards the right. Mm. Now, ministers like uh, Ben Gvir yeah. uh, or Smutrich, uh, one is the national security minister, one is the finance minister. These people used to be seen as terrorists within the Israeli society itself. 
up until the 90s, um, people like Ben Gvir uh, used to be seen as the ones who assassinated Israeli Prime Minister Yitzhak Rabin in, 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 19, uh, in, in the mid-1990s. And now he's mainstream. He's a minister. Hmm. He, he has a, a party that is in parliament and is represented in the government. The Israeli left, which committed war crimes also and established Israel in the first place, but the Israeli left now is something of, of the past. Yeah. The, they all can't pull together 10 members of parliament. Hmm. Israel is run by fascists, ultra-nationalist uh, extremists or ultra-religious ex extremists. We are talking about religious Zionists and uh, nationalist Zionists. Of course, within the Israeli society, there are Orthodox Jews and others, but the show is being run since the year 2000 by extremist nationalists and religious groups. And they are the, the very ones that are committing war crimes in Gaza now, and they have been threatening to do that for the last one or two years. It's, it's, it's not surprising what they're doing in Gaza now. They've been saying this on TV. Smutrich, Smutrich put on, uh, on uh, you know, a, a logo or a, uh, on a podium, put on the, the map of Palestine and Jordan. And uh, he portrayed this as the historical uh, Israel. So, so to ministers in the Israeli government, even Jordan is part of their uh, mm. uh, dreams. Mm. Uh, ben Gavir is... Uh, not only inciting violence, he is arming Israeli settlers right now in the West Bank. So it was, was, was he the it one was Muslim who said there are three options for Palestinians? Yes, Smutrich. Either Smutrich, either you submit to uh, Israeli uh, occupation and or power, you leave, or you leave or, or you, you die. Dead. And he said that in public, and like three yeah, options. It didn't and he's the, a minister. The first now. two options didn't work. Palestinians will never submit. In fact, as ancient as uh, uh, the, the 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 time of the prophets. Uh, the Palestinians are described in the Quran as uh, tough people. In the Quran, Jabbarin. We're not going to give up. Mm. They would rather die under rubble mm. than leave yeah. Palestine. So yeah, the, the Israelis are unleashing uh, hell on the Palestinians. Muslim, just uh, I want to go back to this question of narrative because I think this is part of why we're doing this to make sure that the Palestinian narrative gets out there. You made a fantastic point about how history didn't start last Saturday, mm. but uh, even within from last Saturday. Uh, there is a, there's now counter narratives coming out in social media. It's one of these instances where social media can be a force for good, I think, showing how uh, on the Palestinian side, there was care for some of the Israeli, whether you call them hostages or the people in the settlers whose house, some of the uh, operation, the military operation people went into their houses and were nice <laughs> to them. There's videos of Israeli hostages, maybe being women being, you know, describing their experience being held by, I, I imagine Hamas and and you know some some uh, story about how they were taken care of, they were respected, their children were taken care of. These are all important counter narratives. Nonetheless, Muslim from the Israeli side, they will say that okay, for whatever you call it, preemptive. It's still that Hamas went in and killed civilians and killed children. How do you counter that? This is, of course, the Israeli narrative. The Israeli narrative includes the claim that Palestinians uh, uh, beheaded 40 babies uh, when no not evidence. a single picture can, can uh, emerge. In fact, the White House retracted its uh, claims. I mean, Biden saw, this, saw those photos and suddenly he unsaw them. <laughs> I mean, if, if you saw them, then you saw them. Uh, the Israeli narrative is being, of course, um, uh, aided by international complicity, especially Western uh, uh, support. But let's go back to the situation, the Palestinian narrative, and what happened on the ground. Um, on the 7th of October, uh, the Palestinian resistance uh, 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 fighters uh, invaded Israeli military bases at the uh, border of Gaza. Uh, the border of Gaza is uh, monitored by the Israeli Southern Command. This uh, is Al Qassam, is it? Uh, the, yeah, these Al -Qassam are Al Qassam. Brigade. So, so can you Trained explain to fighters. the to the listeners who are Al Qassam? Are they part of Hamas? Okay, uh, Hamas, of course, is a political uh, movement. It's uh, uh, one of the largest in Palestine, not the oldest, but one of the largest. It's thirty-seven years old uh, now. Um, the movement has. Just like any other Palestinian political group, it has its own military faction. Right. So Fatah has its own military faction. Um, the Popular Front has a military faction. Democratic Front, has, etc. So Qassam is, so Qassam the, is the military, military faction, faction of, of Hamas. Hamas. And, okay. And the name is after a Syrian revolutionary, actually, which is interesting. Az al-Din al-Qassam was a Syrian revolutionary exiled by the French in the 1920s. 
uh, he came to Palestine and he led the Palestinian right. uh, revolution against the British. Right. So uh, there is this uh, okay. historical link. Okay. Back to what Passam happened. Passam yes. Brigades um, is a professional, uh, well-trained resistance group. Okay. Um, so they started a military operation uh, on, uh, on Israeli uh, uh, military sites in the border of Gaza. Military sites. Military sites, of yeah. course. And within three hours, this was a, they were the fighters were taken by surprise. Actually, Israel, yeah. this paper tiger, which has always been bragging about being invincible, um, powerful, etc. Israel <sighs> receives three point eight billion um, dollars of military aid every year from the U.S. Apart from what they spend, five percent of their uh, budget is on, on military spending. So, so uh, this perception one thousand two hundred fighters, yeah. not ten thousand, not hundred thousand fighters. Only 1,200 fighters broke through. stormed into these military camps and Israel's army just crumbled. The deaths of the Israeli uh, soldiers were in the hundreds, probably more. Mm. Um, these fighters found themselves in a position where the, their operation was to go capture some soldiers and come back to Gaza. Israel just collapsed. So some, some fighters carried on. And uh, around the, Isra the, the, the Gaza Strip, are uh, uh, settlements that are uh, groomed and prepared to be a buffer zone between the Israeli urban sites and the Palestinians. These, these are Jewish settlements, Jewish Israeli Jewish settlements. settlements. Yep. These, these settlements are mostly of military, uh, military uh, uh, nature. They, they are not at the border of Gaza uh, to, um, you know, to raise uh, cattle or to... Uh, farm uh, land, they are there in actu actually as a buffer zone. Uh, when the fighters finished their military operation, most of them returned home. Of course, some were killed in action. Now, when they crushed the borders with Israel, many Palestinian civilians went into uh, those territories and these Palestinians were coming back home, you know. The amount of happiness on the faces of these Palestinian journalists and uh, civilians who went into Israel after the uh, the Israeli Southern Command collapsed was amazing. Um, they started to go to Israeli settlements, take photos of uh, their own uh, hometowns and, and so on. So the military operation was over. The fighters came back. Israel faced one of its most, its most humiliating experiences in history. They say that 1973 uh, war was, Arab-Israeli war was the most humiliating experience that Israel uh, has ever experienced. But it is not, because in 1973, Egypt, the largest Arab country with the strongest Arab army, along with Syria and, and Palestinian fighters, uh, attacked Israel. They fought Israel on their own territory, uh, in Sinai and yeah, in not Golan. Not inside Israel. What happened in uh, Gaza, although it was always anticipated, People say, oh, this, this was, they were taken by a surprise. What kind of surprise? You have been blockading <laughs> Gaza for ages. You have been bombarding them, denying them basic, uh, basic needs. And, and your military is all over the place. Your cameras can see anything. If a fly flies in Gaza, your cameras can see it and your satellites. Then they say they were taken by a surprise. They were, of course, overconfident. The Israeli military, the Israeli state is, is too arrogant, overconfident. They rely a lot on technology. They are fighting a war that their fighters and their soldiers know is a lost war. You, you know, you go ask them deep down in their uh, hearts. Israeli soldiers at the border of Gaza know that what they're doing is wrong. Some of them, of course, come out and uh, condemn what, what they have been doing. Some leave Israel altogether. But why, why are you occupying the West Bank? Why are your soldiers inside an occupied the, territory? Why are you at the border yeah, of Gaza yeah. unleashing this kind of terror on the Palestinians? So the military operation was over. Mm. Israel was very desperate, actually. The government of Israel, Netanyahu is finished politically, that's important. The government of Israel realizes that um, they have to uh, cover this failure. They have to uh, get a photo or an image of victory. And how to do that? If they go for a ground invasion, their army will be shattered again. Because these were 1,200 fighters attacking your military bases, not 50 or 100,000 fighters within Gaza. So the best option is to um, yes, flatten right. Gaza, yeah. um, to carpet bomb houses, hospitals. But mosques. before that, Muslim, I have to ask you, and, and you know, although Sharel and myself are very, very obviously and unashamedly pro-Palestinian, there's no ifs or buts about our support for the Palestinian people, but just to challenge you a little bit, 
do you deny that there were Israeli civilians who were harmed or even killed in the military uh, operation by Hamas? You see the Hamas? videos that are circulating all over social media prove otherwise, prove the, the opposite. They prove that the Palestinian fighters were very professional in, in, in dealing with the uh, civilians uh, they unharmed. They, they uh, made made sure that they have not harmed any children. There are in, in fact some videos showing that uh, you know the the women who have been speaking about custom fighters coming to, to their homes and taking permission to eat a banana. Yeah, uh, I saw that. The, the there are many videos proving the opposite, mm. proving that these fighters were not there for uh, uh, civilians. And of course, the death of any human is regrettable. Yes. We, we all acknowledge that. The Palestinians don't want to see more bloodshed and more death, but we want freedom, we want justice, we want an end uh, for this occupation. You cannot um, you know, end occupation by raising flowers in the face of your occupier. It's not going to work. So, but you recognize, Muslim, that there were civilian deaths on the Israeli side. I, I personally have not seen any videos proving such thing. Uh, but of course, in, 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 in a, any a military war, operation... Yeah. There will probably be, uh, uh, and you don't celebrate, but you that, don't right? target them. You don't target civilians. You don't uh, unleash, uh, uh, you know, uh, aerial air strikes on uh, civilian homes. When Qassam fighters uh, attacked Asqalan days later after the operation, they announced hours before the operation that at five o'clock we will be uh, shooting rockets to uh, this settlement. Um, t- take shelter. They have bunkers. They have uh, shelter. We don't have safe rooms. Yeah. yeah, yeah. Go, go to safe. Leave. Leave Ascalon. In fact, mm. the the notification is for them to leave these uh, yep. settlements because they, they are illegal sel- settlements in the first place. Of course, for the international community, um, they don't see Israel as an illegal state. We Palestinians see Israel as an illegal state. Whether uh, um, the United Nations uh, sees Israel as a legitimate state or uh, or not, that's another matter. But uh, the very fact that Palestinians believe in is that Israel is an illegitimate regime that was built on their bones and skulls. It was built upon the destruction of 500 Palestinian cities and towns. It was built using our money. They robbed our banks, our hospitals, our houses, the Israeli ministries. Some of them are still housed inside Palestinian homes, Palestinian, uh, uh, you know, buildings buildings that were built before 1948. Israel continues to, uh, uh, you know, uh, appropriate and steal uh, land from the Palestinians mm. until today, even from its own citizens. There are 1.5 million Palestinian citizens of Israel. Even these people are being subject to apartheid uh, and humiliation. I don't think there is a way to end this apartheid and occupation by throwing flowers at the Israelis. Okay. You have to be a tough in facing occupation, but Palestinians, honestly speaking, Palestinians don't target Israeli civilians don't want to see bloodshed. We want freedom. That's all. Okay, Muslim, we're going to take a break and we'll come back right after this. Selamat kembali ke episod khas Keluar Sekejap uh, di mana kita sedang bincang apa yang sedang berlaku di wilayah semenanjung Gaza bersama dengan tetamu khas kita uh, Dr. Muslim Imran, uh, pengarah, director, founder director of the Asian Middle East Center for Research and Dialogue, Palestinian and also Palestinian who resides and has been residing in Malaysia for the last uh, 20 years. Uh, we spoke in the segment before about what led to and what happened uh, last Saturday during the military operation by Hamas. Maybe now... Muslim, we want to turn to what happens next. Because clearly, the response from Netanyahu and the response from Israel has been bloody and has been uh, extreme. And they've made it very clear, not only are they at war with Hamas, but they want to wipe Hamas from this earth. Everyone is anticipating some sort of ground invasion from the Israeli forces, which means that they will come in and occupy Gaza again. What are you hearing from Gaza, from your side? Is this invasion likely? 
And what is the end game here for for Israel? Um, I felt for the first time in history, Israel was uh, uh, confused for a few days. Um, they unleashed, of course, terror on Gaza and civilians, but that's not military strategy. You know, when Hamas uh, uh, Qassam fighters went into Israeli military uh, camps, they had a military strategy. They wanted to go in, capture some soldiers, get them hostages. Back. When Israel attacked Gaza in 2008, 2009, uh, in the first major war on Gaza, they also had a military strategy and uh, a, some political goals. They wanted to finish off Hamas uh, uh, rule uh, of Gaza. Of course, it failed, but they had a strategy. I feel until today, Israel is still confused and don't have a clear strategy. Of course, this uh, is because of many reasons, including the internal political uh, uh, you know, uh, rift and uh, problems that they have. They are trying to form a unity government, government with others. Some declined, some joined, some resigned from the government. So it's a messy situation. And for many years, Israel's political leadership has been ignoring the advice and Uh, recommendations of its own military establishment. The military establishment in Israel has been advising its political leadership to find a political solution because it's a, a ground invasion and reoccupation of Gaza is not sustainable. It's honestly, I believe it's almost impossible. They might consider it. Of course, now they are under huge pressure, but to reoccupy Gaza and uh, deal with two million Palestinians with hundreds of thousands, probably tens of thousands, or at least a hundred thousand Palestinian Uh, resistance fighters, uh, their families, um, it's just impossible. Israel is a military regime, it's a military state, although it puts a democratic facade. But in Israel, everybody serves an army. The military is worshipped in Israel. So when they lose one soldier, it hurts them way more than losing the civilians. And this actually explains why uh, Palestinian resistance fighters focus on soldiers. Israel is a military uh, mm. society. So um, going into Gaza means they will have hundreds, probably thousands of casualties, casual, military casualties, yeah. like what happened in 2014. Can, can you explain a little bit about the, the terrain of, of Gaza? I mean, is, is it is an open flat. space or is it packed with tall buildings which will make urban warfare very difficult for anyone who comes in to invade Gaza? Gaza is literally a concrete jungle. It's a flat coastal area. They don't have a single mountain. Uh, it's 365 kilometers square, so that's uh, probably half Singapore, if if I'm mm. not mistaken. Uh, it's a very small territory. Uh, it has uh, 2.3 million uh, uh, residents, and because Israel was occupying Gaza until 2005, the Palestinian population lives only in one third of the territory okay. of Gaza. So, uh, you know, the, the, the Palestinian houses... Uh, were built first as refugee camps. Gaza used to be a small city with some uh, villages around it. When Israel took over in 1948, uh, thousands of refugees came into Gaza. Today, 70% of the population of Gaza are refugees who've come from Israel. And these camps are buildings, right? They, they started as small camps, but now they are not tents anymore. They are very crowded Uh, uh, residences, houses that touch each other. There is, there are like hardly uh, enough space for them to walk between houses. Most of Gaza is like this, especially camps in the Gaza city or so on. So there are at least 700,000 residents in the Gaza city, a very small uh, city. If Israel goes in, it's an urban warfare, it's a camp warfare. Israel is unable to handle a smaller mil uh, camp in Jenin. You, you remember a few months ago, yes. Israel's military went into the Jenin camp in the West Bank bombarded it from all over the place, tried to assassinate people. Eventually, they killed a few Palestinians and left. They couldn't take over a camp which is, which is uh, practically under their control. The West Bank mm, West is still Bank. under direct military occupation. How are they going to take on a Palestinian territory which is as crowded as the Jenin, uh, the Jenin camp um, uh, with two million uh, population when they have not been in Gaza for 20 years? The, they have, of course, their, uh, you know, informant, informant sources, mm. satellites, but that's, that isn't enough. There are tunnels under Gaza, for instance. The, according to Palestinians who live in Gaza, there is a tunnel city under but, the, the Gaza city. But uh, are you not scared that because of that, because they are, the Israelis are worried about being sucked into this urban warfare in which they will have very high numbers of casualty, that they will just flatten and 
bomb the hell out of Gaza That's first, exactly which is what doing. they're doing now. They've already told the residents in Gaza City, North Gaza, for our listeners to get out, to move to the south, to Khan Yunus and to the areas in the south. And basically, that's what they're going to do. They're just going to flatten the hell out of Gaza. There is a limit uh, to everything, even terror. Israel is actually a currently terrorist. doing that. <laughs> it's bombing houses, mosques, churches, hospitals, everything. Although they are terrorists, but uh, th- there is a, a, a limit for everything. The international community is complicit, as I said earlier. However, even the international community, when they see these footage coming out of Gaza, a little baby with her he- head split into half. Mm. It's, Palestinians have very tough hearts, to be honest. It's hard for us to cry. But some images just, you can't just, you know, see it and not cry. Uh. This is happening. The international community can give Israel the uh, green light to attack Gaza, but to what extent? The, the White House in the beginning uh, bought the Israeli narrative and started to legitimize uh, their uh, uh, terrorist airstrikes on Gaza. But today, Biden now is regretting the deaths of civilians, including Palestinians. Mm. If Israel continues in the same pace, Tomorrow or the next day, there will be more international condemnation. Yesterday, hundreds of thousands marched in London. I think more will march in the coming days in the U.S., in other uh, uh, capitals. There are many considerations. Israel cannot just keep mass killing uh, people. It is actually resorting now to this strategy because they are afraid to go in. But how far can they go? I think... uh, uh, th- th- there are limits to everything. We've seen that in the Arab Spring, for instance, when some Arab leaders decided to just finish off their own people, the international <clears throat> community came in. I don't count much on the international community, though. Mm. I would rely more on the uh, defiance of the Palestinian people and the uh, strength of the Palestinian resistance. However, everything has a limit. And if Israel continues to kill civilians like this, they are losing the, the war of narratives. They are losing face in front of the world. You failed in the battlefield. You go kill civilians. That's embarrassing. Yeah. And alhamdulillah, thankfully, the Palestinian resistance fighters did not do that. When in reality, they are the weaker side. I mean, for, for a young Palestinian fighter going into, storming into an Israeli military camp with a sleeper and an AK-47 compared to the fluffy Israeli soldiers who have all sorts of vests and cameras and, and uh, M16s and so on. This fighter was still more disciplined, ethical in his fight compared to the whole military regime that he is facing. So Israel is losing this uh, war of narratives. And that's important. And that's why we count on our friends worldwide. They have to march in streets. They have to go down everywhere. Uh, they have to put pressure on the American administration and on the world. Uh, because uh, event- eventually, uh, nobody would like to be associated with war criminals. Yeah. Even before this war, they were all condemning Netanyahu. Now, because of uh, the, the first day of uh, operations, Israel tried to portray itself as a victim. But deep down, Israelis know they aren't victims. So they quickly jumped into mass destruction. So I don't think Biden would like to be associated with Netanyahu. Does he want to go down in history as the U.S. president who gave full cover to the mass killing of Palestinians? I know some of his predecessors didn't mind. They, we saw what they, they, they've done in Iraq, but I don't think he, he yeah. does. I, I think we're m- slowly moving into the geopolitics of this entire situation, which I w- w- want to speak more about. But uh, this is a great podcast um, by um, Sami Hamdi. I don't know if you've listened to that Muslim and I'll, I'll share with you and the viewers where he begins to sp- share the kind of analysis I think you just did for the last few minutes, which is that Israel, I think you made a great point, Israel doesn't have a clear strategy in your mind right now. They're, they're, they're lashing out, they're, you know, they're under pressure, they're stressed or whatever. Uh, maybe one word is they're embarrassed. Yeah. And especially Netanyahu is embarrassed about what's occurred. And an embarrassed person, and someone like Netanyahu, Netanyahu where, whereby even Israelis are asking him to resign this moment, don't you worry though, because he is embarrassed, because he's a hurt tiger, that he will not follow what is rational. Because you've just given a case about why it's not rational for Israel, in Israel's own interest, to go into Gaza. But because he is not rational, because he's hurt, do you think that that risk is actually still there quite high? 
Of course, I believe there is no bound for human stupidity. Uh, <laughs> sure. Men do mistake. Men err, you know. And uh, Netanyahu is, as you rightly put it, is embarrassed and isn't thinking uh, right. Uh, his actions, his uh, military's action isn't very rational. However, the international community, uh, again, everything has limits. The international community is supposedly run by rational men, or that's the assumption. Uh, so there is limit for what is happening. Uh, the dragging on the war, committing more crimes might actually create a spillover effect. Mm. So they started with Gaza, they might end up with uh, southern Lebanon, uh, with uh, a real uh, revolution in the West Bank, with real instability within Israel, because we have 1.5 million Palestinians in Israel, Palestinian citizens of Israel, who in 2021 rallied against the Israeli attacks on Gaza and more than 10 of them were killed and some Israeli police officers were killed in the tensions mm -hmm. that took place. So if Netanyahu pushes the limits further, I think the Palestinians, their allies will also push things further. Muslim, I want to come back to Hamas for a second before we move on to the regional picture and the geopolitics of, of what's happening. So... For the benefit of listeners, Gaza is administered by Hamas and the West Bank is administered by the Palestinian Authority, what was formerly the PLO um, with Fatah and uh, Mahmoud Abbas in charge. Now, my question is, to what extent does Hamas represent the Palestinian people, especially the Gaza, the residents of Gaza, given the fact that the last time you've had an election... 2007? Yeah. So can you claim that Hamas is acting on behalf of the Palestinian people in Gaza or is Hamas acting on its own political objectives? Of which I have to say, one of Hamas's stated objective is to make sure that Israel is dismantled as a state. Uh, you see, we need to touch on history uh, a bit. In 2006, Hamas won uh, an overwhelming uh, um, majority in the Palestinian parliament. In 2005, Hamas boycotted the presidential elections. So a president from Fatah was elected as president. Uh, the prime minister was appointed from Hamas because it was uh, the majority in the parliament. And... Um, for one year, they tried to work out their differences. Uh, Fatah refused to join a, a unity government uh, in uh, 2006. But after things developed uh, further, you know, the, the deep state was with Fatah. They did not cooperate with the new administration. Within a few months, the, the, the whole uh, situation uh, got tense. And we had a unity government temporarily. In 2007, insecurities in Gaza and tension and international boycott of the Hamas government, Israeli pressure on the Hamas government resulted in uh, a geographical uh, division. So Fatah took over the administration in the West Bank and Hamas continued to administer the Gaza Strip. Um, ever since, no elections were held. Now, Hamas is probably more confident of winning any elections in the Palestinian uh, context than uh, President Mahmoud Abbas or, or Fatah. Because of many reasons, I'm not going to delve into that. Um, Hamas is the younger generation of the Palestinian people. Look at Ismail Haniyeh, the, um, the chief... Uh, Your the leader, leader of Hamas. Bureau, leader of Hamas. He is, uh, uh, I believe, uh, he's not even 60. Uh, President Mahmoud Abbas is 87. Um, and this generational gap is actually there within the Palestinian context. So if elections were held, Hamas, other resistance factions the socialists and others would probably win an overwhelming majority. That's why President Abbas was avoiding elections throughout the years. In 2021, they all met and agreed to have national elections. Um, in the last minute, he cancelled elections and under the pretext that Israel wouldn't allow it to be held in Jerusalem. Yes, yep. Israel is to blame, of course, but this was the same case in 2006. So I believe if an election is held, uh, to me, honestly, personally, I don't mind who wins. I don't care who wins. To me and to many Palestinians, what matters is whoever wins will protect our national rights. What I'm trying to get at is, are Palestinians in Gaza upset with Hamas? Because they're saying that, look, you're the problem here for the Israelis. And because you are the problem, we are suffering. Or are the Palestinians in Gaza with Hamas? 
you see, uh, it's difficult to measure people's sentiments, but I, I tell you, if you talk to any Palestinian anywhere in the world, the amount of pride they have now, the amount of uh, happiness they have that they are actually finally, after decades, able to liberate Palestine. Of course, not overnight, but what happened on the 7th of October was uh, 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 probably a rehearsal of what will happen in the future. We will liberate Palestine. We have been waiting for the Arab world, the Muslim world, and they have their own problems. Now the Palestinians can finally actually rely on their own uh, uh, you know, community to, to achieve that, but we need the international support to achieve mm -hmm. that, of course. So uh, I think uh, elections aren't enough in the case of an occupied nation to measure how popular a party is. That's a good point. If there are uh, elections in, uh, so for instance, um, professional unions or student councils, usually Hamas and Fatah are neck to neck. But in the case of an occupied nation, legitimacy doesn't come from the ballot box only. Yeah. If you're fighting for your people, you are a legitimate leader of your people. Do you think Nelson Mandela was elected by the South African people when he was leading the <laughs> struggle? That's a good point. Or uh, George Washington or, or anybody for that uh, sure. sake. Yeah. You lead your people because you put your neck for your people. You take initiative. Leadership is initiative. Taking yeah. initiative. Hamas has been taking initiative for decades now. Uh, I wish Fatah will, uh, uh, you know live up to the expectations of the people. Fatah was one of the earliest national liberation movements in Palestine and the Middle East. Of course. They have contributed a lot to our struggle. But under the current leadership of President Mahmoud Abbas, Fatah was turned into uh, something else. And, and maybe, KJ, just my, my observation as well, if you see what's been in the international news, some of the spokespersons are not from Hamas and they're not criticizing them. Yeah. They've been quite you know, sure. helpful in the overall Palestinian narrative. If you criticize the resistance, Habit, Hamas, Jihad, or whatever, you will be framed as a traitor in the Palestinian yeah. mind. This is very important. Sure. But, but you know what I was trying to get at. The Israelis yeah. are saying that we want to destroy Hamas. Yes. So the, that's our, narrative. Israeli is saying our problem is not with Palestinians, it's, it's with Hamas. Hamas. Yeah. I guess that's where we were. But they have a yeah. problem with Mahmoud Abbas as well. True. Sure, have sure. they True. Uh, addressed his needs? Have they even met him? He yeah. has been telling them, he, I am a peaceful uh, Gandhi. Let's meet. They don't want to meet since 2014. Is there a real threat that the Hamas leadership, of course, it's difficult to wipe the Hamas movement out because Hamas live with the Palestinian people in Gaza. But is there a real threat towards the Hamas leadership? I mean, just while we're talking, is Ismail Haniyeh being targeted by Mossad? He lives in Doha, if I'm not mistaken. We agree that uh, Netanyahu is not a rational uh, leader. Of course, anything can happen. And previously, Israel has targeted Palestinian leaders everywhere. Inside Palestine, in the diaspora, uh, they assassinated the founder of Hamas, Sheikh Ahmed Yassin. They assassinated another leader, Abdelaziz Rantisi. They, uh, to many Palestinians, we believe they are the ones behind the, the killing of uh, the late Yasser Arafat, the yeah. president of uh, the Palestinian Liberation Organization. So uh, if, if you are a war criminal, you are capable of anything. However, would this affect the Palestinian resistance? No. Would it, this affect our struggle? I don't think so. Mm. Because we have lost more leaders than anybody can count. And as long as there is occupation, our leaders and people are willing to sacrifice. Muslim, just bringing this into a broader context in the region, a lot of geopolitical observers are concerned that this is going to spill over. So we've seen the exchange of missiles and, of course, instigated by Israel into southern Lebanon for the benefit of our listeners in Kluas Kajab listeners and, and viewers. There has been a group in Lebanon known as Hezbollah, which is a Shia group. Just to explain to everyone, uh, Palestine, Palestine is, is, is largely Sunni. Hamas is a Sunni organization, but um, Hezbollah is Shia, backed by, by Tehran. Do you think that they will be dragged in? And do you think the Israel missiles into southern Lebanon was a message from Tel Aviv to Hezbollah and to Tehran to stay out? I believe uh, the US has panicked more than Israel after the 7th of October operation because they saw uh, their hegemony in the Middle East being shaken. Few months ago, we saw how France was chased out of the Sahel, out of Niger, out of uh, Burkina Faso, Mali, Mali. etc. Um, to many 
American decision makers who look at the Middle East as their own backyard, as their own uh, territory. You know, the Middle East is one of the few regions in the world where the U.S. is the hegemon. There are a few pockets here or there for the Russians to resist American hegemony in the Middle East. Unlike South China Sea, for instance, where there is some sort of rivalry between two different uh, poles. In the Middle East, it's an American territory. They, they tell you what to do, what to eat, what to wear. They decide who becomes your president or your king, literally, in many countries. So when the resistance uh, took down Israel's uh, you know, um, dignity as a, a, a superior military power that the Americans have been counting on for ages as their police officer in the region, the Americans panicked. The American warships came to the region. Yeah. Not to help in fighting a few soldiers. What, what is a warship going to do to a few fighters carrying AK-47s? But it was a warning to the rest of the region, probably to Iran, to Hezbollah, and to others that we're not going to let Israel go down alone. Um, I believe the same also, the same logic applies to others in the region, uh, the supporters of the Palestinian struggle, be it uh, on the, uh, you know, uh, op opponents of America side or the American side. Some countries are under the American umbrella. I, I understand that in the Middle East, Arab countries and Muslim countries. But these people don't want to see the Palestinian resistance wiped out. They don't want to see the Palestinians submit and surrender. Israel uh, has proposed to the Americans to send over 2 million Palestinians from Gaza to other Arab countries mm. where they can be absorbed and, new, and nat naturalized. Not even a single Arab country accepted that. And these are American allies. So, of course, the possibility of the decline of American hegemony after what's happening is there. That's why the Americans are coming in, uh, expressing their solidarity with Israel, Blinken coming in, the mm. defense minister coming in. Uh, to, we have to counterbalance that, of course. What is happening now is big. What is happening since the 7th of October might be one of the most uh, unprecedented uh, geopolitical shifts in the history of the region. But uh, it depends on all actors. How do they uh, behave? Yeah, I think we can all agree a lot of it depends on what kind of events shape after this or shake out after, uh, shape out after this. Uh, but uh, to your point about uh, the fear for American hegemony being reduced, uh, how American allies, even Muslim countries in the Middle East are responding, these are all uh, analysis that I think our listeners would, would appreciate. But maybe taking off from that, what are your views or what's the Palestinian view on how certain Arab countries have um, been equivocal about their support for the Palestinian cause, if I can put it that way. And, and I say this as a Malaysian, not with you know, undue pride, because KJ, you, we have this term called NIMBY, right? Not in my backyard. It's easy. I, I want to be humble here as well. I think Malaysians, we have to be humble as well. We cannot take the moral high ground and say, oh, we are better than Arab countries because we have unwavering in our support to Palestine. Maybe because we're not living near Palestine, KJ. Mm. But, you know, we'll see how we treat the Rohingyas. Some of the conversations I've had privately uh, is that, oh, kita, we, we celebrate things, we demonstrate. But when Rohingyas came here, <laughs> you know, even Malaysian Muslims are not always friendly. Mm. So anyway, my, my point being, still... Nonetheless, what is the Palestinian view on, on you know, how Arab countries have moved the Abraham Accords and, and all the rest of it? Can I just attach a supplementary question to that, Muslim? You can answer through you know, both, both questions from Sharon and, and myself. Do you think one of the reasons, other reasons, of course there were reasons that you've explained perfectly clearly in the first segment, for last Saturday's military operation by Hamas, was it also because of this move towards normalizing the relationship between Tel Aviv and some Gulf or Arab countries under the pretext of the Abraham Accords, the concern that once all these other countries are suddenly having a relationship with Israel, then everyone's going to forget about Palestine and we need to move now. Um, I believe uh, freezing normalization was one of the byproducts of the resistance military operation, but it wasn't probably the main uh, goal. It was one of the fruits of uh, the operation. Um, the Palestinians count a lot of, uh, on, on the uh, international solidarity movement, on the Arab people, on the Muslim people, on the free people of the world who have been supporting Palestine, Christian, Hindu. I got a phone call yesterday from a Hindu friend mm. expressing full solidarity and telling me, brother, is there anything I can do? To help the Palestinians, I've received a call from a Christian, uh, evangelical Christian, 
usually many evangelical Christians are pro-Israel, unfortunately, because of the war of narratives. He said the same, I'm with you. So we count on the people. We count more on the people than politicians. Oh, you are politicians, you might not like it, but uh, we would... <laughs> no, anymore, ex, no, anymore, not today. <laughs> uh. you, we would count more on the people, the, the people of Egypt, the people of Syria, the people of Saudi Arabia, the people of all these Arab countries have contributed immensely in favor of Palestine and in support of the Palestinians. They sacrificed a lot. And even the countries, the governments, the regimes, in many cases, Egypt fought wars with Israel for us and for their own uh, national sovereignty as, as well, Syria and others. However, as we speak, the current uh, situation, uh, the problem is international politics rather than mm. the feelings of uh, leaders. You know, I, I believe that some of these uh, Arab leaders, uh, of whom none is elected, of course, uh, <laughs> I believe deep down, many of them love Palestine. They sure. so, you know, sympathize with the Palestinians. In fact, many of them were proud of what's happening uh, uh, on the 7th because Israel was like a monster scaring everybody and suddenly this group of freedom fighters brings its military down to its knees. Um, however, there are a lot of calculations, international politics, international relations. If you look at the Middle East, as I mentioned earlier, there is this American hegemony in the region. Almost everybody is under the American umbrella. So whenever they think of reacting to what's happening in Palestine, they think of what Uncle Sam will think first. And then they take a decision. If, we, they, if they were dem democracies, had they been democracies, things will be very different. If you are a democracy, you will, of course, listen to what your people want. I mean, you will have the IR calculations in mind, but you will still worry about next elections. In the Arab world, there was a very brief uh, experience of democratization, uh, which didn't last long, the Arab Spring uh, you know, days. Um, the, there was an attempt to democratize the, the region. I think... Uh, the West, in particular, played a major role in undermining democracy in the Middle East because they know very well if the Middle East and the Arab countries in particular become more democratic, their foreign policy will become more independent. Their mm. reactions towards Israel and mm. Western interests in the region will be very different. Yes. Uh, but anyway, for the Palestinians, they have to, of course, rely more on their own uh, people. We count on the international solidarity movement. I see people in the civil society here in Malaysia, in the Middle East, in Europe, in America, putting their necks out for the Palestinian struggle. They have been really committed. I, I, I know a friend who uh, came from hospital to a rally in front of the US embassy uh, last Friday. Friday. So there are people who are really committed to this struggle. And for these people, the Palestinians won't give up. We will not let them down. Can I just say, KJ, I think that's amazingly gracious because of how much Palestinians have been let down, yeah. even by their Muslim brothers. Yeah. There's still room in someone like Muslim yeah. Imran, our guest here, to recognize that probably in the heart of hearts of the leaders themselves, they sympathize. They say that but you, are you even, even in your situation, you're trying to empathize with their own IR calculations. And I think that's, that yeah. speaks volumes. Yeah. Charil, in closed door meetings, some leaders, Middle Eastern leaders, who even have relations with Israel, in closed door meetings, they feel very proud of what the resistance is doing and tell the Palestinians, keep doing this. But in front of TV, uh, uh, yeah. you know, things change. We're going to take a break and come back about Malaysia's response to what's happening in Gaza and also what happens to the peace solution with what is taking place in Gaza today. Selamat kembali ke episod khas Keluar Sekejap berkenaan dengan isu Palestin dan juga apa yang sedang berlaku di wilayah semenanjung Gaza bersama dengan tetamu khas kita Dr. Muslim Imran pengarah kepada AMAC iaitu di Asia Middle East Center for Research and Dialogue. We've had a very rich discussion about what's taken place in Gaza over the last week. We've also had a uh, good analytical discussion on the geopolitical impact of what's taking place. Now, I want to focus on Malaysia. And, um, and finally, we'll wrap up the, the podcast with the way forward for the peace process and whether or not the peace process is dead. But let me start with Malaysia first. And again, I'd like to remind our listeners and viewers 
Dr. Muslim Imran has a PhD in Malaysian foreign policy from the University of Malaya. He's a uh, head of a think tank, apart from being an advocate uh, for Palestine, his homeland, uh, as well as a member of the International Bureau of Hamas in charge of Asia. Muslim, you have been here for almost 20 years. You've been in touch with our government. I've worked with you uh, several times. I believe when former Prime Minister Datu Sri Najib visited uh, Gaza, uh, you were with him. And um, you've been monitoring Malaysia's support for, for Palestine for the last two decades. And I think it's fair to say that although we're not in the Middle East, and perhaps if we were physically, geographically in the Middle East, our response may be a little bit different. We have the benefit of distance being you know, far away. But Malaysia has been one of the biggest champions of the Palestinian cause in the Muslim world, especially in Southeast Asia. Are you happy with our official response to what's happening in Gaza right now? Um, I, I would agree that Malaysia has always been consistent on the Palestinian issue since the 1960s. Um, but I believe Malaysia can do more, to be honest. Um, Many Malaysian friends, especially from the foreign uh, services uh, uh, sphere, say that Malaysia is a small country. Um, not much can be done. I, um, I, I would like to disagree with that. Malaysia, in international relations terms, is a middle power. Uh, its uh, economy places it in the top 30 uh, countries of the world. Its uh, uh, institutional, uh, uh, you know, um, uh, the structure, its uh, democracy, its uh, uh, dynamic society, place it in one of the advanced positions. Look at its universities, for instance. Um, UM, one of the Malaysian universities, is the top university in the Muslim world. If you compare only with, the, with Europe or with East Asia, things might be different. But comparatively, compared to the Muslim world, Malaysia is in a really good position. And you have a dynamic, uh, uh, you know, society. You 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 can speak to the world. Your diplomats can talk to anyone in the world. We want to see all of this utilized in this struggle. Let me share this uh, story, and I don't know if I should share it or not. But let me just bring it up <laughs> because after one week of the destruction of Gaza, I feel Malaysia has to do more. Mm. Um, I met uh, Prime Minister Anwar Ibrahim in 2021. Uh, I've had the honor of meeting him and many other Malaysian leaders on many occasions. But in 2021, when he was still the opposition leader, um, I met His Excellency briefly. And uh, at the end of the meeting, I, had in, I handed over a letter back then. At the end of the meeting, he, he mentioned or he told me, imagine how much we can do for Palestine if I become prime minister. That's 2021. I met His Excellency last Ramadan. I attended an iftar. They kindly invited me along with other NGOs. And uh, his officers kindly arranged for us to have a brief meeting with His Excellency. Again, I reminded him of this, actually. I told him, Your Excellency, you told me uh, a year ago, or that was two years ago, imagine how much we can do for Palestine if I'm a prime minister. You are now the prime minister, and we have high expectations. He said, Inshallah, we will do something. But the government has been very preoccupied with domestic politics and other concerns for a year or, or so. Until now, one week after the Israeli attack, uh, the response isn't what Malaysia is capable of doing. Um, I remember Prime Minister Najib visited Gaza, for instance, right after the Israeli war on Gaza in 2012. He, he was there in 2013, January. Uh, Prime Minister Mahadir would uh, uh, unequivocally condemn Israel. He demanded that President Trump resign in 2020. Um, uh, Prime Minister Mohideen Yassin uh, made a phone call to Ismail Haniyeh in, uh, during the, the war on Gaza. I expect Prime Minister Anwar to at least make a phone call to uh, Ismail Haniyeh, maybe Mahmoud Abbas as well. Maybe the foreign minister should go to the Middle East. Uh, I'm, I'm, in not, I'm not in a position to tell uh, the leaders what to do. At the end of the day, they have their own political calculations, but I have expectations as a friend of Malaysia. And because I know the Malaysian people are in favor of our freedom and are one of the strongest nations. You know, I heard this from Turkish people. They told me our government is friendly, but the Malaysian society is way more 
engaged with the Palestinian issue and committed than many other societies in the Muslim world. So I expect this to be reflected in the foreign policy. Um, there are, of course, some, uh, you know, handicaps, difficulties, international uh, relations-wise, economic challenges, but uh, Malaysia is doing way better than many other countries in the Muslim world, and it can actually usher through uh, some progress in the Muslim world, not only in the Palestinian uh, cause, but also in, um, in democratization, in uh, uh, good governance, etc. Yes, it has its own problems and uh, flaws, but who's perfect in this world? you are more trusted in the Middle East than many other countries in the world. Um, I don't want you to send your troops to fight in Palestine. Well, the Palestinians have not asked anybody to do so. Yeah. But uh, Biden called uh, Netanyahu five times since the start of the attacks. Five times. Mm. Some world leaders have been heading to Israel for pilgrimage, like Blinken, who came to Israel and said, I'm here as a Jewish person not as an American uh, official. We want to see these Muslim leaders heading to uh, Palestine, to Gaza. It's, it's hard, of course, to get... But at least to the West go Bank. To Egypt. No, yeah, go West go Bank. Doha. No, to West Bank, it will be a bit controversial yeah. because he has to go through Israel. But go to Doha. Doha. Mm. Go to Cairo. Yeah. To Istanbul. Any of the neighboring... Give a phone call to President Biden. Ask him to stop the, the crazy Israeli genocide. Mm. Um, uh, a lot can be done. Of course, uh, again, understand the local uh, context, but I think um, more can be done. I saw statements from different leaders, from that Surizayat Hamidi in the parliament, mm -hmm. from uh, Wisma Putra, they issued this two, two statements. Um, uh, but I expect the prime minister, honestly, to take lead because he is seen as an international statesman in the Middle East uh, and he can do a lot. Yeah, uh, no, I think that's really powerful coming from you, uh, Muslim. Um, maybe you want to talk more about Malaysia KJ in a bit, but since your answer was framed as such, maybe let's talk about OIC. Mm. Uh, uh, you know, we've been talking about politics and geopolitics in different parts of the world. I wanted to bring up Pakistan and Imran Khan because I think that was the kind of sort of non Middle East Muslim leader who clearly saw the Palestinian cause as something that he really wanted to speak on, not just for domestic political audience, but also in an international audience. He's now no longer obviously in power in, in, in Pakistan, Islamabad. Uh, but uh, you have any hopes about the Arab League and the OIC maybe step up in the next few days? Well, they should. Uh, if they don't, we will see more uh, bloodshed, not only on the Palestinian side, uh, the situation will develop further. So uh, I, I do expect them to play a role in uh, mitigating, uh, uh, you know, or, or not mitigating, in, in, in ending the Israeli attack. However, um, not many parties in the Middle East uh, are happy that the resistance is on the rise. Some of them would rather maintain a status quo forever. Mm. Uh, some of them would rather see the Palestinians, uh, you know, submit and accept to live uh, uh, in, in peace. Uh, without getting any of their basic rights. But the overall situation, of course, is, uh, is one where they would like to see uh, stability in the region. Um, are they doing enough? No, they are not. Uh, we haven't seen the Arab League co convening for an, an emergency summit. Hmm. We saw five uh, Western leaders issuing a strong statement together. The Americans, the British, the uh, Germans, and I think the Italians, I was surprised... The Italian people are more friendly to our struggle than many other Western societies. But anyway, they expressed the commitment to support Israel. Where is the OIC and Arab League commitment to end the occupation on Palestine? Um, for some countries, what happened actually undermined their uh, uh, efforts to build ties with Israel. Now, uh, what happened, of course, should... Uh, push them to ponder upon the situation. Mm. Those who normalized relations with Israel because they are very fearful of Israel's mm. military capabilities and intelligence capabilities, whether they want to benefit from it or they're scared of it, they have to think twice after the 7th of October. Muslim, I, I want to finish our really, really important and, and I must say credit to you, excellent podcast session today. We're talking about what happens to the peace process because I think now 
nobody is thinking about the the two state solution, the peace process. What started off in '93 in Oslo when um, Arafat and and Yitzhak Rabin shook hands um, and and agreed to to commit themselves to this peace process of having these two, two states. Now, no one can think about that. The Palestinians are thinking of survival. The Israelis are thinking of revenge. The international community is all over the place, as you rightly pointed out. And we are perhaps further or the furthest away from the peace process than we've ever been in the last 30 years or more. But coming back to the peace process, can you imagine a day once this is all done that we will come back to the peace process? And I wanted to ask you once again, Dr. Muslim Imran, as member of the International Bureau for Hamas, do you guys even believe in a two-state solution because Hamas wants to dismantle Israel? On the other side, none of the Israeli political groups, major political groups, accepts the two-state solution. The, the mantra about two-state solution in international uh, corridors, political corridors, is, a, is, is, is just a big lie. There's a lot of hypocrisy. Americans want it. But in reality, Israel has killed it. And the Palestinians have always realized that it's impossible to, to, to see the two-state solution implemented. You know, the Palestinians want peace. The Israelis want the process. That's very important. The Palestinians have always wanted peace. Um, whatever that peace entails, um, as long as the Palestinian refugees return to their homelands, the shape and look of the uh, state has always be, you know, been something to discuss. But of course, uh, we want full uh, achievement of our national rights, like return of refugees and independent Palestinian state, etc. But the Israelis on the other side, from day one, were only interested in the process. They knew that they will lead negotiations forever. And it continued for more than 30 years, since the Madrid uh, conference in 1991, Oslo Accord 1993, until uh, now there is a peace process, but no, uh, no real Israeli uh, political group believes in it. Netanyahu doesn't believe in it. He doesn't meet with the Palestinian leaders at all. It was imposed on the Palestinians because of a structural change in the international political order. The Soviet Union collapsed. collapsed. The, the Arab world was shattered after the first uh, the Gulf War. So the Palestinians under the leadership of Yasser Arafat felt that they had no, no choice. They had to accept something. This something never materialized. Mm. 30 years after negotiations and after working with the Israelis, the Palestinian Authority and the Palestinian Liberation Organization worked side by side with the Israeli authorities to build a Palestinian state, but it never materialized. The Palestinian president needs a permit from the Israeli military to, to travel from Ramallah to the world. They bombarded our airports, they uh, uh, destroyed our state institution. At every uh, juncture, Israel makes sure they flatten all of our national institutions. How are we going to achieve independence or any of our freedoms uh, through the peace process? We are not interested in the process, we are interested in freedom. That's why I, I actually want to conclude with this. I don't think it is very important for our supporters, friends, and the international community to bother much about um, uh, two-state solutions, three-state solutions, one-state solution. That's not, that's not important. Let's mm. focus more on addressing the situation. There is injustice. There is an occupation and apartheid. End them. Once you end them, there will be peace, regardless of uh, how things will unfold. Yeah. Look at South Africa. There was injustice. They pushed for uh, you know, justice. Eventually, th there was a solution. No, I think that's been last really, yeah, really powerful. Um, and my only last thoughts is we've discussed at length, especially this latter part of our conversation about how everyone's geopolitical interests and political interests uh, have, to, have to be moved and have to be taken into account. But one thing that's clear, it was the Palestinian people that actually made everyone rethink their calculations. Now Netanyahu has to rethink. Arab countries have to rethink. Malaysia has to rethink. And that didn't come from nowhere. It came from, from the struggle of the Palestinian people themselves. And, you know, KJ, I, I think this is the right time to reflect on what our holy book says, that victory comes from Allah. We wish you all the best Thank you so much. In, in the days ahead. We pray for the Palestinian people. We pray for peace. We pray for everyone in the region, of course. But 
mostly for freedom for dignity and that in our lifetimes we see a free sovereign and dignified palestinian homeland and state amen dr muslim imran thank you very much for coming on kluas kejam